Welcome. Uh, you are a team of water scientists today. Did you know that when you came here? No. Yes. Well, if you didn't know, you know now. And um, I'd like to share with you more specifically the kinds of scientists you're going to be today. And actually, you're going to be doing this, the same kind of work all three of these different scientists do. Some of them are called limnologists. So you can go home today and tell your parents you were a limnologist today, all right? Study lakes and streams and bodies of water. Uh, some of you are going to be aquatic entomologists, all right? That sounds pretty fancy, right? Yeah. What does an entomologist study? Animals in water. What group of animals? You're right. Insects? Insects, water? right. Oh, aquatic say. insects you specialize in, all right? <laughs> And finally, some of you will be aquatic ecologists, where you're looking at everything, the life and the, the non-living parts of the ecosystem, too. So three different kinds of aquatic scientists, and you'll be doing a little bit of work of each one of those three. So you've got some pretty fancy titles today. And what I want you to think about is that, gee, these people get paid to do what you're doing every day. This is their work, their life. So if you enjoy it, Think about that. This is a potential career for you, all right? We need people uh, to do this kind of work. I like to call it, and I, th these aren't my words, but how about we're, we are taking the pulse of the planet today? That sound good? Yeah. Like what do we mean by that, taking the pulse of the planet? Um, I think that we mean by that is um, um, like we kind of are examining the earth of what it really is. Great, that's a good way to put it. We are examining the earth and we're gonna focus on the water. Last time I checked, we need water to live, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, and today's, what we're gonna focus on is our pond water that we have here and our stream water, which happens to be part of the Rouge River. So two different bodies of water. Some of you um, are gonna head to the pond and you're gonna look at the life of the pond. And based on what you find, we can turn that actually into a score using an index. And so we're trying to answer the question today. The driving question is, how clean is our water? And again, we're talking pond and stream. Folks that are headed to the stream, we're gonna look at the stream in two different ways that scientists do this. One is simply a group of you will do what's called a walking survey where you're going to be observing everything about the stream, the depth, the width, the color, the smell, the is it shaded, is it open, what does the surrounding land look like around the stream. All of those factors are very important um, to understanding how healthy a stream is. So you're going to do that walking survey. The other group is going to go down to the stream and you're going to measure the water uh, physically and chemically. We're going to use some probes and test kits and so on and we're going to measure things like oxygen and pH and other parameters that are important. And just like the uh, invertebrate index, there's an index that's been designed for those tests and we can come up with a score for the stream. So we're not only going to look at it qualitatively, but quantitatively, too, to try to answer that question, how, how healthy is our water? So that's your task today. Are you up to it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. That's what we want to hear. Before we head out there, let's look at a couple of quick things, and we'll get moving. One way to think of a watershed is think of it as a valley. But actually, it's kind of weird. We say that we call it a watershed, but we're actually talking about an area of land that drains to a river or a lake. That's called its watershed. So you live in the Rouge watershed. And look at how many watersheds we have in Oakland County. Six of them, to be exact. And the water, depending on where the water falls in Oakland County, determines where it's going to flow. If it falls in the Rouge Valley or watershed, it heads south out to uh, the Detroit River. If it falls in the Clinton watershed, which, by the way, is just about a mile up the road here, it goes uh, east over to Lake St. Clair. This is a little one called the Bell River. It flows east also to the St. Clair River. These two flow north. This is the Flint River here. We've all heard about the Flint River, right? And this is the Shiawassee River. Both of them flow north up to the Saginaw Bay. And finally, we have the Huron River, which again is just a few miles west of here. It flows all the way to Ann Arbor 
and then turns and comes back to Lake Erie. All of that water eventually ends up in Lake Erie, but it starts here. And so look at that. Most counties in Michigan probably only have one or two watersheds, but here in Oakland County, we've got six of them. And all of this would be called the headwaters area. The headwaters is what part of the river? What do you think? The, the beginning, the beginning of the river. Wouldn't we like to think that this water is clean, not polluted? Imagine if this water and the headwaters were polluted, what it would be like as it travels downstream and goes through Detroit and all those other communities. It would be, it could be in pretty bad shape by then. Here's a picture of the entire Rouge watershed. Here's Bloomfield and West Bloomfield up here. We're up in the headwaters. All this water comes down here and flows out to the Detroit River. But look at all these communities that would be affected by polluted water if that's what we send to them. So we don't want to do that. So we're hoping this morning that the answer to the question, how clean is the water, we hope it's clean. All right, here's our local streams. Now it doesn't show your school on here because this is Bloomfield Township and of course your school's in West Bloomfield, but it'll be just over here. And the stream closest to your school would be the, the Franklin branch of the Rouge, the one that goes by the um, cider mill, right? That's not very far. In fact, Walnut Lake behind your school actually drains into that Franklin branch. And then uh, they all join down in Southfield. This is Birmingham over here. And as the further south you go, um, the bigger the river gets. Here's the nature center where we're at right here. And our stream is fed by a few lakes across the road, Forest Lake, Lower Long Lake, Upper Long Lake. It feeds that stream. And then it heads down to the Cranbrook campus where other streams uh, join it. And then the river gets bigger, goes through Birmingham and so on. Um, so there's quite a few of these little streams around. So again, some of you are headed to the pond. Don't forget that the uh, organisms that you're looking for live, some of them swim freely here, some of them live in the sediments, some of them live on the surface of the water, some of them even crawl up on the plants that grow out of the water. So they all have their little niches or their little habitats that they prefer. Probably most that you see today will be here, the free swimmers or the ones in the sediments. And some of them are really tiny. I mean, so tiny, you might not even see them with your eye until we put them under a microscope. But they're extremely important as far as the food web goes and keeping everything alive out there. Don't forget the fish, the frogs, the turtles, the big birds that come to the pond all rely on food sources like this. So they're all very important. And they each play a role. It's kind of interesting. The, some of these that you're going to collect fall into these different categories like shredders. You ever think about what happens to a leaf when it, like especially this time of year, it falls into the pond, the leaf sinks, right, eventually? Bacteria and fungus start working on it immediately, the decomposers. And then along come the grazers and the shredders, maybe even the collectors. These are different names for the uh, kind of bugs that you're going to collect today. Um, they shred these leaves. Within a few weeks, you, it's no longer a leaf. It's gone. It's disappeared. But it's become part of the food web. So all of that's really important. Yes? Uh, what river is here? The Rouge. Yep. The very beginning of the Rouge River. What are the common things you might find today? These are probably the most common that we see here. Dragonflies, snails, and clams. <clears throat> water mites is actually a type of an arachnid that lives in the water. Sometimes aquatic worms here. Other things would be damselflies, mayfly nymphs here, um, scuds. Caddisfly larvae are really cool. They build a little house of sand grains or sometimes twigs live in that as a, as a nymph stage, as a larvae. And then eventually they'll um, become a fly and fly above the water. Sow bugs, scuds, as I mentioned. All those are possibilities. And this is what we'll do with your list of what you find. We're going to plug it into this index right here. You notice that this index has three groups, one, two, and three. Group one is sensitive to pollution. 
So um, if we don't find any of those, that, may, that could be a bad sign. So we're hoping to see some of these. Over here on the other extreme, we have the tolerant group. Now, just, let's say we just find stuff in that category. That doesn't automatically mean that the water is polluted, but it's possible. We would probably have to do other tests to determine that for sure. And then there's a group in the middle, and you will recognize some of these names here. So you're going to list everything you find on the board here. We'll add up, and there are points given. Group one gets five points, group two gets three points, and this group only gets one point. We're going to add those scores together, and here's your index down here. We have an excellent, good, fair, and poor range based on your score. So we'll get a quantitative answer here to the question, how clean is our water? And for those of you headed to the stream, these are the nine tests that you're going to do. Oxygen is the most important thing. You can't, things can't live without oxygen, so it's considered the most important test. We're going to measure that. We're going to measure bacteria levels, pH, temperature, phosphates, nitrates. We're going to measure how clear the water is. All of those are very, really important to the life. And this is what we do. We put our scores here. We convert them to a Q value. Q means quality. So we have a, a little chart that you use to convert. Then we multiply the Q times the weighting factor to get the, that point value. Add that column up, and your score will end up somewhere between 0 and 100. If you get Q values in the 90s, that would be considered an excellent water test. Uh, 70s and 80s would be good, 50s and 60s fair, below 50 would be considered poor water. So that's true of our final score here as well. Um, we hope to get, you know, at least in the 70s if possible, but we'll see. We'll see what we come up with this morning. Finally, the last thing, why is this important to do? <clears throat> there are so many good things that we get from wetlands. What do we mean by wetland? I'm talking swamps, bogs, marshes, swamps, uh, or rivers, lakes. Look at all these things we get from them, and they're free. They don't cost anything. They control floods. They clean water. They filter water. They recharge the groundwater. Some of you have wells at home instead of, you know, like what we call city water or Detroit water. Those wells need to be recharged, that water underground, that groundwater. They protect, uh, these are great places for fish to lay eggs. They're home to the endangered species. There's a tremendous variety of life in wetlands, more than um, the other kinds of ecosystems. They're resting areas for migratory birds, and they're great places to hang out and have fun. A lot of people go to these wetlands to um, have fun. So all those are good reasons to do it, but we certainly need water to survive. So we need to take the pulse of the planet, and that's what you'll be doing today. All right? One last statement I'll leave you with. Some people say <clears throat> every act of conservation matters. Your testing the water this morning is an act of conservation. It matters. We need to, to monitor, to watch this stuff. And your data today is what? One day's data. But when you compare that to past data and to future data, that's where it really becomes important. So our first study is dissolved oxygen. Why do we need to know how much oxygen is in the water? Any ideas? So things can breathe. Yeah, we're not the only people that need oxygen. Do fish need oxygen? They actually do, right? They, they breathe air through using their gills, right? Even the insects need oxygen. So the less oxygen that's in the water, the poorer the quality of the water is for fish, right? So we want those numbers nice and high. The next study is fecal coliform. What do you think that studies? What is fecal? What does fecal kind of sound like? Yeah, it studies the waste in the stream, right? Um, where would waste be coming from? The animals. Well, a little bit from the animals living there. It actually comes from us. Um, have you ever seen someone walking a, a dog on the sidewalk and it uses the bathroom? What happens to that waste? Do they always pick it up? 
they don't always pick it up, right? That's just one source. If it rains, that waste will break down and it will wash into a storm drain. Where do our storm drains go? Sewers. It doesn't go in the sewer. It goes right into our backyards, to our streams, to ditches that lead to our streams and our rivers. That all ends up in the water, okay? If that happens a lot, we'll, we'll start to pick it up and we'll see it in our water. Actually, Bloomfield Hills has 300 septic systems. 300 houses are still on septic systems. That can impact this value as well. Septic systems are kind of like a miniature water treatment plant for each house. And it's a, it's a box, it's buried underground, and all the waste from your house enters in that box and the bacteria eat it up and then it leaches out into the ground. So if there's anything wrong with any of the septic systems, that waste can actually enter into our water systems as well, okay? So that's our second test. This is our bird clock. It's telling us we're starting. When you hear the bird again, it'll tell us that we're about done, okay? <laughs> we're, gonna about, we're gonna be doing our test for about an hour, okay? So this is, I would say this is kind of the harder test because there's a lot of terms we're using that you might not be used to. So you have to really put on your, your science goggles today, okay? Be good listeners, which you guys are doing a great job. pH, how many of you would like to take a bath in lemon juice? Nobody, right? Well, the lower the pH number is in our streams, the more like lemon juice it is, the more acidic it is. Our fish, our organisms, don't like to swim around in lemon juice as well, right? Our animals, even our plants, like a certain range of pH. The, the closer it is to neutral, to that middle value, the better it is. So the range goes from 0 to 14. Closer to 0, you're looking at like lemon juice. 14, you're looking at baking soda. So we want it right in the middle so it's nice and neutral. So we have this pH meter that we'll use to get that value. If you like to cook and you like to follow recipes, then this is the test for you. This is biological oxygen demand. And this test studies how much oxygen is pulled out of the water in order to decay all those leaves and sticks and stuff in the water. If there's a lot of oxygen being pulled out of the water, is that good? No, because we need the oxygen in the water for our organisms, right? This is a five-day test. So we had to prepare it over the weekend for you guys, okay? So we took a water sample. We figured out how much oxygen was in that water sample. And then we took a second sample and wrapped it up in aluminum foil so it was nice and dark. We put it in a dark cabinet. And now we've waited five days. We're going to open it up and see how much oxygen is in there now. If there's a big change in that value, has there been oxygen being pulled out? Yeah. yeah, so if there's a big change in that value, we know that there is a lot of oxygen being pulled out because of that decomposition process I talked about. We want it to be almost the same, all right? Temperature change. Mr. Badgley took a temperature reading this morning upstream. Now we're gonna take another temperature reading this afternoon. Why do we care what the temperature range is upstream versus downstream? Are we looking, are we wanting it to be different or do we want it to be the same? Maybe because more fish go upstream. If organisms are moving down the stream, right, and moving around, we, we want it to be nice and stable for them. If the temperature upstream was nice and cool and the temperature downstream is warm, what could be happening in between? Harrison? Um, Water that wasn't from the top stream that was hot was going into the downstream. Exactly. And you would be surprised. There are instances where businesses have been slapped on the hand for actually pouring stuff into the water. So this is a way for us to figure out, is there anything going in between upstream and here that we need to know about? OK? So that's a good test for that. Phosphates and nitrates. Um, these are tests to see how much of our uh, fertilizers are ending back into the water. We love our nice green grass, right? And we live, or the Nature Center is right across the street from a beautiful open field with 18 holes and a nice stick. Anyone know what I'm talking about? A golf course. And golf courses are fantastic, but they do need to use some fertilizers to 
keep that grass green, right, and lush. So sometimes that uh, fertilizer can wash, the excess fertilizer can wash into the stream and that fertilizer in the water will make those plants in the water grow big too. That's a problem because when the plants grow, they're taking oxygen out again. Is that a problem? Yeah. Yes, we need that oxygen in the water for the organisms. So we test for nitrates and phosphates to see about fertilizers. Two more tests and then we're gonna head out. Turbidity, turbidity. If you're ever um, in a room and it's really, really smoky, do you like that? Does that feel good to your lungs? No. Same thing with cloudy water, right? If, if water is really cloudy, the fish feel kind of the same way. They have to use their gills to, to suck the water through to get the oxygen out. If the water is filled with particles and cloudy, it, the water is cloudy, it's hard for them to breathe too, okay? So turbidity is a way that we test the cloudiness of water. The less cloudy the water is, the more clear it is, the happier our organisms are, okay? Well, fish eat little organisms, but those little organisms couldn't, in the water, but those little organisms couldn't survive without fresh water that is clean enough for them to live in. And same with the fish, so as the fish eats the little organisms, we eat the fish, so we need them to have clean water. And last but not least, if you're looking at a perfectly clear glass of water, is it okay to drink? No. Is it clean? No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There could be anything in there. There could be fecal coliform in there. There could be minerals dissolved in there from a number of sources. Those minerals can actually um, house pollutants and make the water toxic. So the, the way that we check for the minerals in the water is we, we weigh an empty clean beaker, then we fill it up with water, and we dissolve all the water out in the oven overnight. The next day, we're left with kind of this scum in there, right? What is that scum? Mm -hmm. The minerals that were dissolved in the water. The water looked absolutely clear, but there are a significant amount of minerals in there. So we weigh it again, and we can tell how many minerals are in there based on that new weight, right? Yeah, Sasha. So I have a question. So if, if what, so is tap water necessarily clean, or could it still have all that other stuff in there? Tap water, um, our cities and counties, our state, they're held to a standard of how clear the water needs to be, how clean the water needs to be. And if you look at your mail sometimes, you'll see that your parents are getting mail from the city or from the township saying, this is the status of the water. It usually comes in their water bill. And they'll list out all the nutrients. They're held to that level. They need to keep it a certain cleanliness. So, you know it's a certain cleanliness, but a lot of people still filter their water, right? Just in case they feel better. Um, you know, our water sources are, um, are always changing. There can always be issues that pop up, so I think people use that extra layer of protection just in case. But the water coming out of your tap should be clean, right? Um, I think that's about it. We're gonna take some of our our equipment down to get some readings and then we'll take a water sample and bring it back and do the rest of the readings okay so this dissolved oxygen probe is really sensitive so if I give this to you don't take the cap off okay I'm gonna step you guys through each of these procedures um, and these the equipment can be a little feisty all right so who wants to do DO how about you right here pH I'll try to get it so everyone does something, okay? I, want, I know you guys wanna do this stuff and I want you to do it too. Um, temperature, just do right in front. This one will be done inside, this one inside. Let's do a water sample. Who can get me a water sample? Gabriel? And who wants to be our note taker? He's got nice clean writing, good note taking skills and possibly would be interested in presenting with a friend at the end. Who might want to do that? Gabriella? Is it Gabriella? Gabriella? Okay, who wants to help her present at the end? Sasha. Okay, so while we're collecting the data, make sure you guys are nice and quiet so these two can listen particularly well because they're gonna be telling the rest of your, rest of the kids here today um, what you guys found and why it's important, okay? All right, you guys ready to go for a walk? 
What would change pH? What kinds of things might change the pH of water? Fecal. No. Except the there's pH again. <laughs> Minerals. The acidity of the water. Um, Minerals, that's lake. good. Minerals, so minerals from the soil, when it rains, that rain goes into the soil and leaches out minerals, and that can make our groundwater more acidic or more basic. Also, the plants around us can make our water more acidic or basic. What do you see on the ground right here? Pine cones. Oh, pine, pine needles. needles. Pine, needles. Pine, needles. pine needles. Pine needles are actually a very good source of vitamin C. Come inside. So we're gonna do dissolved oxygen oh, first. So she's got the DO meter. She's gonna to turn it on. You don't get to Ooh. step in the water. Good. Okay. So you're gonna put the meter right into the water. So get down on your knees. Okay. <laughs> okay, everyone watch. And you can hold it by the cord. Hold it up here a little okay. ways so you don't get your hand all wet. And you're gonna switch, switch the meter around in case there's any bubbles at the bottom of it. And put the meter all the way in the water, not to the bottom, yeah. just like that. Now you need to wait just a minute, wait just a minute until the number stabilizes. We're looking for the percent saturation of oxygen Oops. in the water. The higher the number, the better the value. What do you, you want to go? You want it all the way, almost all the way full. <laughs> it shouldn't number? be over the hundred, right? What's the highest number? Hi. Usually we've been finding 80s, 90s, so. That's um, good. But it changes a lot, right? That's good, right? The higher the number, the better, right? What if it's over 100? Oh, it's dropping. Is there any pond that's 100? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So remember what we said, zero to 14, and we want our pH right in the middle, so what would that number be? Seven. So when the number stops, that's your value. How? No, it's not like, we're not going to go outside yet. Sasha. Or those are outside. He's just afraid to literally walk in the water. I don't have rainbows on right now. Okay, did I swish in case there's any bubbles? Like tall rainbows. My rainbows would be here, maybe. Okay, 8.04. Okay, so we have one more thing. We've got someone that's going to get our water sample for the rest of our studies. Gabby. What do you guys think? Does the water look um, clean? Yeah. It looks dirty? Oh, it's not, it's not okay. So Gabby, put the cap on. What? Drink it. Why don't you drink it? So I see tiny seeds. I'm not tiny. Does it, does this water look look clean yeah. or dirty? Looks clean. Okay. But there's like stuff. I can I can see my hand right through that bottle. It's pretty clean, I think. So let's see what our values actually show us. Okay. And then I want you to go sit at the table where, where your friends are sitting. Be careful of the crutches on the floor, okay? We're gonna go one by one and, and analyze what our data means, okay? So dissolved oxygen, we got 74.9% saturation. And we use these Q charts to determine what that means for the quality of the water based on that that factor, okay? So 79.4, we look for our number on the x-axis of the chart. You see where 79.4 might be? We would find it probably close to 80, right? Mm -hmm. What you do is then you take your value and you go all the way up until it, it intersect, intersects the slope, okay? So right here, we would intersect right up here, okay? Does that make sense? Everyone see it? Then you follow that number all the way over to figure out what your Q value would be. What do you think that would be? 85. About 85. So for dissolved oxygen, our Q value is 85. Now, remember I said the top tests have more importance than our bottom tests, okay? So dissolved oxygen is the most important test that we do. So we multiply our Q value by the biggest number. So we're going to multiply 85 times 0.17. I have a question. Hold on just a second. So what is it? 14.45. Okay, so 14.45, so you write that number at the wa water quality index. Okay, so we're going to do that eight more times. What's your question? Uh, why do we want to swallow living organisms that drinking water? We don't want to swallow living organisms necessarily, but um, have any of you guys ever gone fishing with a relative? A couple of you? Was that experience important to you? Um, do any of you like to eat salmon? Yeah. Or trout? Yeah. Are you allergic? <laughs> And do any of you guys like to go on hikes and just sit and watch for animals? Not watch animals. These resources, these resources, if we don't protect them, um, they'll go away. There won't be the fishing trips, right? Mm -hmm. There won't be fishing trips if there's no fish in the stream. Um, you won't want to go on a hike outside if the water smells like eggs, right? You know, we, we need clean water, not just for ourselves, but we need it for the organisms in there. Those organisms feed us too. We eat salmon and we eat trout, right? So it is important that we keep the water clean for those, those organisms. So fecal coliform is our next test. This is um, a test that we use with um, Petri dishes. Um, they're called cultures, okay? So when you do labs in high school and in, if you go on to college, you're going to be doing this a lot. How many of you want to be a doctor when you grow up maybe or a nurse? Awesome. How many of you maybe want to be like a forensic scientist or an investigator? None of you? That's kind of popular right now. People like like the um, the the 
the who done it type stuff, right? Um, we have lots of professions that use these lab techniques um, in ways that you'd be surprised. When I was in college, I got my master's in soils, and there was a new soil program that was all lab program, and it was called soil forensics. Pretty crazy. But they worked with police departments to figure out who done it, right? And when did it happen? These are the same kind of tests that, um, that they use to figure out what's in the soil, what's in the water. Is there contaminants? So for our water sample, we're interested in knowing, is there any waste in the water? Cool. Could that waste um, hurt someone? People in the ag industry use these tests a lot, right? You've heard, you might have heard some um, recalls for lettuce because of E. coli, right? This is an E. coli test. So we know that there is E. coli in the water. If there's a blue or dark, dark purple dot, do you see a blue or dark, dark purple dot? Yeah. Yes. That means there is waste in the water. And this is from a water sample taken from the stream here. Is that real? Can you put it it is real. It could be from a number. Could be from a number of sources. Usually E. coli is, is from human waste. That was, this was, uh, this was our sample taken a couple days ago. This is our sample from yesterday. Does it take a long time? That's much better. Much better, right? You should have seen the sample from this weekend, this weekend before. It was, it was crazy. There was all kinds of bacteria on there. What happened last weekend, you remember? Anybody outside? Get rained on? A lot of hail, a lot of rain. What happens is those big events will will do a flush. They'll flush off the parking lots, the sidewalks, and all that stuff ends up in the stream. And we found a ton of E. coli. How does it change from that to that that fast? Does the water stay put? Does it stay still? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. It continues flowing downstream, right? But if you go downstream farther, would you find that? We contribute our water to downstream sources. So if we have contamination in our water, downstream will eventually have that contamination as well, right? Okay, so for this study, it's pretty easy. All, you, all I want you to do is count the number of blue dots. Blue or dark, dark purple dots. How many do you see? Just on two. this one and this one. So you see two on this one? Blue How many? On? This is from the other day. Blue. The red one is normal bacteria, right? Our skin has bacteria on it all the time. That's why your parents say, wash your hands. When you want to wash off some of that stuff to make sure that you don't get sick, right? How is it called by here? What's that? Like the dots, how are they come up on here? Evaporation. There's a, there's a special fluid that we mix with the water, and it creates a gel, and this bacteria can grow on it. But if the oh. fluid's contaminated? It's not. It's sterile, and it sits in our freezer. So if you ever come to visit, and you need to put your food in the freezer, don't get it mixed up with the E. coli chemicals. <laughs> Just kidding. No. So we have two on this one, and we have how many on this one, you think? One. Maybe just one right there, right? We take the bigger number, and then this is a study for a 100 milliliter sample, and we took five milliliters to do this study. So 100 divided by five is? 20. 20. We found two, so two times 20? 40. 40. Okay, so our, our colonies of E. coli would be 40. Yeah. Is that good or bad? Let's see, so let's find the Q value. So this is our quality chart. We're looking for 40, this is the x-axis. We have 20 right here and 50, so we would be just shy of that 50 value, right? We go straight up from from where 40 would be to where the slope intersects? 56. About 56? Yeah. That looks about right. So our Q value for fecal coliform is 56. So now you multiply that number by the weighting factor. You got that down there? So it's different. Remember, each one changes to a little bit less weight. So what do we got? What do you get for your oh. index number? 8.96. What is it? 8.96. Okay, 8.96. We're trying to get as close to 100 at the end as possible. pH. 
We use the pH meter, we just dip that into the water and it tells us a value. Technology can be fantastic, right? Yeah. So pH. Yeah. What was the value? 8.04. Okay, so find 8 on your x axis. 80. 85. 82. 82? Yeah. Okay, 82. So our Q value is 82, so write that for Q value. And then multiply it by the weighting factor. When there's less water in there and the leaves are still in there, you think the leaves might be taking more oxygen out of the water since there's less water? Yeah, they did. Yeah. It's good to take this test and do it throughout the season and see how it changes. Okay, change in temperature. What was our two temperature readings? 8.2 and 7.9. Okay, 7.9 upstream, and then it was 8.2 downstream. downstream. So what's the difference between 7.9 and 8.2? Use your brains. 0.3. 0.3, right? I forgot the question. <laughs> so, Q value chart. Negative 10 to 30 is what we see our slope at. We're at, so 0.3, that's almost zero, right? Yeah. So, that's the best value you can get. That's, that's perfect. So our Q value, if you follow it all the way over, our Q value for that would be? 92? I would say 92. It's a little, little low. <laughs> so you got that? Q value for change in temperature, 92. Okay. This is where we're going to divide and conquer for a minute, okay? Phosphate and nitrate. I want you two over here to do phosphate and nitrate. That means, remember what I said, read the instruction all the way through and then start your test, okay? Okay. So you know what to anticipate. So you're going to do the nitrate, you're going to do phosphate. Phosphate instructions are here, nitrate's right here, okay? okay. Wait 60 seconds and then you compare the bottom color with that bottom. Oh. Does that make sense? You can start. Does that make sense? Two, three, I'm going to compare four, this color five. with this, okay? And it may be really low. Can I just hold it like okay. this for 40 minutes or seconds? Yes. Yep. Then you compare it with the color on that, that tube over there, okay? And then give your data to... to what's your name again? Gabriella. Gabriella. Give your data to Gabriella, okay? We're going to use this fancy schmancy machine that shoots a beam of light through the water in the machine to see how many particles are floating in the machine. It looks almost as clear as the water that comes out of the faucet, right? Maybe you should put it on the table so it's easy. Well, it's good. He's, he's measuring with, um, eye level with the meniscus, right? So, almost there. Oh, there you go. Okay, now put the cap on. Okay. You can put the pipette down. Good, and wipe the, the bottle off. We don't want fingerprints. No fingerprints for you. Okay, okay now open the lid. One, Take that other sample out. Did that test? That tested a perfectly clear sample. There's no sediment in there. You, you gotta line up the scent? line. Don't like it. Okay, now hit enter to scan the sample. Just enter. Oh, enter. <laughs> I put your gun. Okay, so our value is 1.27 NTUs. This scale is from a 0 to 100, so the clear 1.27 for turbidity. Is that bad? The lower the number, the clearer the water. If it goes 0 to 100, is one. One's a great value, right? So yeah, the water is very clear. Phosphate, what do we get for phosphate? Eight. Nitrates, our Q value is what? Zero. Like 97. 97. If we did good on all the other places and we wanted to clean up the river, where would we focus? Phosphates. Phosphates. How do we, how do we get phosphates out of the water? And nitrates. We have to stop them from coming in the water, right? And phosphates come from what? Oil. Fertilizer. So we did this test yesterday, or we started it yesterday. We weighed an empty, clean beaker, and then 
We filled it with 100 milliliters of water, of stream water. Then we put it into this oven. oven? That's an oven. Mm. You're going to use these a lot in lab. Looks like a microwave. And it looks like this now. The water sample was perfectly clear like it was for us today. But look at all those dissolved solids in there. Those are all minerals dissolved in the water. So okay. it was not safe. Well, there's, there's a lot more dissolved minerals than you would expect, right? Because it looks clear. Mm -hmm. So now we took our first weight, which was 49.654 milligrams. Now we'll weigh it again. We have to stay absolutely still because even the movement of air will make the weight move up and down, okay? So we started off with 49.654. We have 49.681. But when you see it there, yeah. the stomach yeah. foot comes out on the left. So okay, we got a wheel here. There's though. one so wheel there's snail, there's yeah. which looks like that. So there's the foot that it taps. Oh. It's upside down, and there's its rasping part. That's right. Now look, it's trying to find. Um, look at it latch onto that plant. No, it'll just it'll just get algae algae from the plant. But look at, yeah, see, so you've got a variety here. This is the gill snail, which can be in less good water. This is going to be a, a gilled snail, which needs better quality water. You can see the antenna. You can see its stomach foot coming out here. Stomach foot? Yeah, that's how it eats. It just absorbs food. So, good job. We have found so far a few wheel snails, a few mayflies, um, an aquatic worm, some damselflies, and I just found a um, probably a that dam looks like a damselfly. This is a new experience for you, and for you to um, to grab those papers, collect that data, and now you're presenting to the whole group. That is uh, a tremendous feat, okay? As you guys go through school, you're going to be taking surveys. You're going to be questioning, well, what's the purpose of this? What is my claim, right? Um, I'm looking at a study. I need to collect data, and I need to make a claim. What, did, what are my results? What does it all mean at the end, okay? So we have three groups. Each of those groups took a snapshot of the stream. What does the water quality look like? What do the habitats in the stream look like? What do the macroinvertebrates in the pond look like? We're going to correlate all that data together now to see what is the, the health of our watershed here at the Nature Center. So where is our stream survey group? Where are our presenters? Are you guys going to present? Wait, which one? Oh, that's you guys, I guess. <laughs> all right, so come on up. What did you guys find? There is no precipitation in the last five days. The air temperature is 49 degrees Fahrenheit and about 9 degrees Celsius. Um, so the water temperature we found was 46 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, the average stream width that we found was uh, two feet across. And then it was uh, one foot deep. Uh, we also found that the velocity of the surface was, um, for per every six feet, it was uh, 27 seconds to cross. Um, also, we found that the estimated water flow was, um, so, I can't read. <laughs> okay. I did, I did. Okay. okay. So, um, uh, this had, the stream has not been canalized. Channelized. Channelized. Channelized, yes. Uh, that means straightened with a bulldozer, bulldozer pretty much. Uh, yeah. The clarity was clear because you can see the bottom and there was no odor. Um, there's, there was trash in the, in the bank, or on, along the stream bank and not in the trees. It was mostly made of clay, then silt, then sand. How did you figure out what the stream bottom was made of? Uh, we, um, we felt it. <laughs> yeah. You actually have to take a scoop in your hands and feel it. If, it. if you rub it between your fingers, you've got, and it's gritty, that's sand. If it's slippery, it's clay. She felt it for us. Okay. So we saw her feel it. <laughs> All right, keep going. So, um, 
Um, they're mostly trees and shrubs yeah. and a little bit of grass. And the stream shading was about 100 to 76 percent. Wow. And um, also the bank erosion, there was little of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, the, there was um, blockages, and um, the blockages were like log jams. And um, also, there was aquatic plants, and those are macrophytes. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and those are aquatic plants growing in or floating on or growing out of the water. Yeah. Uh, so the surrounding land was like woodland and wetland. And, That's yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, from your observations, what would your claim be? What would you say? your results would be? Is it a, is it a stable, healthy stream? I would say so. Is it a polluted stream? A little polluted. A little polluted. We saw like a couple okay. bottles in there. Okay, so a little <laughs> bit of, a little bit of human impact there. I heard a, a like a log jam in there. That can sometimes cause some flooding. That's right. Log jams provide habitat for our macroinvertebrates. They they provide shelter for our fish. They're very important, actually. Um, so that's uh, a good job, guys, and your group. Good work. So that's a snapshot of the physical character of the stream. Let's take a snapshot of the chemical character of the water in that stream. So our chemistry group is going to come up. So for our water test, we have different um, water tests. Okay, speak up and out to the group for us. We had different water tests for the water, and we went from most important to least important. So the most important was dissolved oxygen, which is CO, and then it was fecal coliform, XG, pH, biochemical oxygen demand, BLD, change in temperature, total phosphate, TP, nitrate, NO3, turbidity, and total phosphate. And here are our test results. And so um, for dissolved oxygen, it was 74.9. For fecal coliform, it was 40. For pH, it was 8.04. For biochemical oxygen demand, it was 0.5. For change in temperature, it was 0.3. For total phosphate, was 8. Nitrates was 0. Turbidity was 1.27. And total solids was 0.027. So for Q value, our lowest ones were total phosphates, which was 6 and our basal coliform, which was 56. What, it, what do the phosphates tell us about the water? What's in the water if we've got a lot of phosphates? Do you remember? Um, Comes from, for, yes, fertilizers, okay. And then we times that by our weighting factor, and then we got our water quality index, and so we added all of our totals up, and for our overall water quality was 74.64. 64. 64. So, yeah. Okay, so that's a lot of data, right? They did a lot of work this afternoon, so great job. You can see, you can see our, we got a lot of 80s and 90s. This, the range goes from 0 to 100, so we got a lot of passing great scores, um, but we had a couple that were low. The phosphates were low because of fertilizers coming in, and we had some fecal coliform, which is an indication that there's actually some waste getting into the water. Waste isn't the only source of pollution. So when we're talking about water pollution, it's not just waste in the water. It can even be minerals from the soils that can cause a, a water to be polluted. It can be detergents um, from a car wash can end up into a system. It can be fertilizers from a neighborhood 
um, who uses a lot of fertilizers for their lawns, and that can wash into a system. So there's lots of sources of pollution, and obviously, like trash, right? Um, people need to maintain their vehicles because even a leaky vehicle with oils or anything coming out, that all is part of our system. And when it rains, that stuff washes off our parking lots and into our streams, okay? So overall, we're not up in Montana somewhere with a bunch of water flowing through. We're in Bloomfield Hills, and it's a lot of people here in a smaller system with a little bit less water. So that value right there is a great value for us, OK? All right, so who are our pond groups who had studied the macroinvertebrates? So you can take a dry erase marker and go ahead and just fill in your values on the board. Okay, oh. so we were limnologists and we were studying the macroinvertebrates in the pond and to there, see the water quality. And there's three different groups. So group one is um, sensitive, group two is somewhat sensitive, and group three is tolerant. So for group one totals, we got the mayfly was common, and so was the gilled snails. And um, we found that there were two common, um, two common. Yeah, maybe you guys switch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, we got a total of 10.6. So our overall total for group one is 10.6. And then for group two, we found that the dams. Damselfly. Damselfly. Dams, damselfly was common. The dragonfly was rare, and scuds were also rare. So this means we had two rare and one common, and the two rare added up to a total of six, and the one common added up to three point two. So our total would be 9.2. And lastly, we had our tolerant group, group three, which the aquatic worms were rare. Um, the midge larvae were rare. The pouch snails were common. And the water mites were rare. So this means we had three rare for a total of 3.3 and one common for a total of one. And our overall for group three was 4.3. And then overall, we got a total of 24.1, which was in the fair group. So um, yeah, we, our conclusion is that it's fair. Okay. So look at this, we have two Two observations in group one that gave us a value of 10.6. We have four in group three, but our number is only 4.3. Why is that? So we forgot to explain that because group one, um, the sensitive group, are the most important. And because of that, they uh, count for higher points. Very good. Yeah, just like that chemistry, the chemistry that we did, those values were weighed against um, a number and they were multiplied. The more important um, things were on top had the bigger number and the less, lesser important had a smaller number. The same thing with this. These are our important macroinvertebrates because they can only survive in, in healthy water. These are our lesser important macroinvertebrates, so they're given a little less value, okay? Did you have a question? Uh, I'm just going to point out that our data is right on the side, and it lists it from almost important to important. Okay, did everyone hear that? So this is the data that they collected on this side, and they, li they listed it from most important on top to least important on the bottom. So the ones that are more tolerant to water pollution are on the bottom. Yeah? How could you tell if the insects were um, common or rare? So if you saw, well, how, how okay, so what defines that? If it was common, then there was um, like more than 10, or 10 or more tally marks for the amount of um, 
like like macro invertebrate that we found. And if it was rare, there was less than ten. What's ten? Ten. Okay. So it's how many times they saw them when they were doing the study. How can we, if we question this, we look outside and the pond looks pretty healthy and pretty nice, but our value came out at fair, what would you do? If you're questioning your test results, what do you do? Redo it. You redo it, right? You redo it. Now, if there was a big difference in your test result from this morning to your second test, what would you do then? Take a third test. Take a third test. You keep testing until you figure out what's the real data here. Um, you have to repeat your procedures exactly the same in order to compare your data from, from one to another. How else could we change this study? They went down and they went to the pond and they collected from the dock, say, right? Or the bridge. How else can you repeat this to see if this is an accurate result? Um, go to another location. A Yes, you could go to a different location to see if it was different in a different spot of the pond. Would these numbers be the same in the summertime? No. no. Maybe. I don't know, right? It's getting colder and those macroinvertebrates are starting to kind of go down and hide, right? So you might get a totally different result in the summertime. So you, can, you could also test from season to season if there's any change there. Okay, so this is saying that the, the water quality in the pond is fair. Our chemical analysis came out at pretty good in the, the stream. Our chemical analysis, or our physical survey said that there was uh, a lot of vegetation and not a whole lot of trash. So raise your hand if you think that our overall, overall quality in our water systems here is poor. I think it's poor. Who thinks it's fair? Okay. Who thinks it's good? Okay. Who thinks it's excellent? Okay. So it's pretty split. Fair to, to good, right? We are right on that line, but we're not in Colorado. We're not in Montana. For what, for where we are physically in the water system and our surroundings, the topography around us, the water coming into the system. For, for our setup here, with just a little bit of water coming in the system, and rolling hills, this, this test result is showing that we're doing really pretty good, okay? We couldn't get 100%, because we just don't have the capability to get 100%, right? We don't have the water coming in. We don't have the room for this stream to meander back and forth. This is the nature of the, the stream here. Do I have any questions about um, what we talked about today? Who had a good time? Good, that makes me feel good. Well, you guys did a fantastic job. I hope to see you guys again. I think we're all done. Okay, everybody, please take a round of applause.